I did music until I was 20 years old and uh, I was going nowhere fast and partying a little too much and needed to get my shit together. And so I quit and I ended up getting married at a young age. I have three beautiful sons. I started my own oil companies later on in the 99 that all run themselves now. But up until then, I worked for other companies and learned how to, to do things and knew I didn't want to work for a corporation and be kick, you know, kissing people's ass all the time. And, uh, I just told my dad, I go, I learned the oil business. He got me into Chevron and I said, I'm going to take what I've learned. And I'm going to roll the dice and start my own and, uh, huh. the rest is history. So welcome back to a brand new episode of the inner sleeve music podcast, the podcast, taking a behind the scenes look at all things music, Cassius Morris here, joined by Joe Pacheco, as per usual. What's up, Joe? The same, man. We're Canadian, so the weather affects us. <laughs> and as you can see, the sun is shining on my face, you know? <laughs> it's got a full-on tan over here. It's, it's, yeah, uh, we love it's, it. It's a gorgeous spring day, man. Definitely. Canadian uh, spring vibes. And happy spring break to everybody out there watching. Hopefully you guys are enjoying and soaking up some sun and hopefully have some great music as well to listen to while enjoying this fun time of the year. Today on the podcast, we're joined by special guest Kurt Dimer. This was a really cool episode for anybody in the music business because Kurt is a really multifaceted person. He's a businessman. He's an entrepreneur. He's acted in many movies. We talked about his appearances in horror movies such as Halloween and really just an overall awesome character to chat with. We talked about his new single, Doom, which drops on April 14th. He also has tour dates announced with Buck Cherry and Skid Row. So if you guys want to get in touch with Kurt with any of the stuff he has coming up, Hit the links down below in the description. We have all that info that you need. Some very sad news out of the world of rock and metal this past week. Of course, the concert collapse in Illinois at the Morbid Angel concert, which left 40 people injured in hospital and one dead. You know, Joe, I don't even know really where to start with this situation. This is, you know, for anybody who may have missed the backstory of this, there were four bands set to perform on this bill. In the midst of a super serious storm in Illinois, everybody packed inside to get out of this storm and, of course, do things indoors. And the Apollo Theater ended up collapsing on the crowd inside. It's horrible. I mean, and, and, the, and, you know, the worst part about this is it could have been worse because I think this was early on in the evening. And as you said, there was like three openers, right, for the for Morbid Angels. So it's like, imagine it happened later on. It would have been probably even of a worse disaster. But I mean... I say that with all due respect to the the one person who did die, uh, which we see here is, um, I forgot his name. Oh yeah, Frederick Forrest Livington uh, and Junior, sorry. A 50 year old man was killed on the roof of the venue, uh, you know, collapsed. And uh, it's, I don't know, man, I'm at a loss for words when this stuff happens. I'm just like, feel so blessed that it wasn't me or anyone I knew personally. And uh, it's also interesting that, like, you know, not that with all this technology, like bands can start like this, you know, a fundraising campaign we saw last week with um, Wayne Sweeney, right, from uh, yeah. Saliva. They started a, a GoFundMe as well for the daughter. Um, I mean, that's pretty much all I can really say. I feel really bad for this, man. Definitely. If you guys want to support the GoFundMe here as well, we will put the link down below in the description for anybody who wants to support the Livingston family. And definitely rest in peace and get well soon to all of the survivors of this accident. There have been some interviews coming out with people who are witnesses and people who were involved. And, you know, needless to say, this was a very tragic situation. So everyone here at the Sound Mojo and Watch Mojo family, uh, we're here sending our best to everybody involved. And we hope a quick recovery for all survivors. Now, this past weekend was a very interesting one here at Sound Mojo headquarters. I was sent out on a field assignment to cover the Infected Mushroom concert, which went down at Midway in Edmonton, Canada. And I got to say, Joe, you know, I know that you were somewhat familiar with this group, definitely a new group to me. And I feel like the whole EDM scene is sort of something I'm just dipping my toe into. So I feel like, you know, compared to you, I'm a complete, complete noob in this department. I'm a noob too as well, but yeah, I've been <laughs> maybe a little longer because of age and stuff, but uh, yeah, no, in fact, the mushroom has been around for a long time. I always saw their CDs and I heard people, you know, people have told me, check them out, check them out. And 
finally I did. And I was like, wow. I was like, I did not see that coming. Um, what they do, the production style, how clean the mixes are. It was just like, wow. I just, I dove in head first, man. Uh, and went through all their catalog. So when you mentioned, hey, I'm going to see Infected Mushroom, I was like, wow, you're lucky, man. I always, you know, not I always want to see them, but I would love to see them. Uh, but so, how were they? It was cool. You know what? It was quite the experience. Now, for anybody who doesn't know, these sets usually happen pretty late. I'm used to like nine o'clock <laughs> headliners. They said Infected Mushroom starts around midnight. So I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to keep myself awake. I feel like an old man. I'm 24. <laughs> I feel like that was this stuff was made for me, but here I am. Uh, so we went down there. I went down there and it was at a cool venue because this was not a typical concert place. This place is actually like a bar arcade club hybrid so it was like all three of those things mixed so usually on the weekends people you know my age go there to party have a good time play the arcade games so having like the club dance floor in the middle of it and the sort of environment all around having it designed like a club was really different for me for an edm show because usually when i've seen edm it's usually been outside and it was nothing like a club or bar environment um so yeah like that was the first thing i noticed was that it was a smaller you know the roof was lower and i was like how is infected mushroom going to do their pyro and all that so it turns out joe this wasn't one of those shows where the pyro was going off or any of that i'm curious for you you know as someone who loves this type of music is that an important element for you or does it even matter if there's any pyro in a show like this it's a good question because someone like me doesn't you know like i don't cr- care too much for all the fluff and all the extra stuff i go for the music kind of thing but since these are not actual not in a sense of performing musicians with guitars bass and the traditional setup um i guess that sort of would leave make me feel like you know i missed out on something whereas i hear you sing these big edm productions but i mean like within reason you're like you said it's low ceilings you're not gonna have pyro we've all seen how bad that could be in in those type of yeah exactly uh, but uh, i don't know it's like i had never seen them so and then you know to be honest like i also don't know what their actual show would look like mm-hmm. when they play like a tomorrowland or uh or whatever so I, I maybe i wouldn't have missed anything you know what i mean i would have still been in for the vibe yeah the sonic assault of the music just really hitting me you know because i can't put my car stereo that loud or my radio that yeah. loud no, I think that's what it is for sure. And and that seemed to be the vibe in the room. And again, me, I'm sort of an outlier because anybody who is at this type of show, I would assume is at least an intermediate EDM listener. I'm sure they know, you know, probably at least 10 DJs by name. Um, so it was very cool for me to observe that. But I think you're right, Joe. They seem a lot more focused on just the music. And I feel like this is like the deep end of the pool more so when it comes to mainstream EDM because – my first shows I was exposed to, my first ever one was Odessa. And that was at an outdoor festival. And I feel like that is something that is so much more catered to the mainstream audience. Whereas this was definitely catered for the people who are into that hard EDM. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think it was really cool though. And again, it was something that I hadn't really experienced. They had the people there spinning fabric too, and sp- like juggling in the audience, doing all that weird psychedelic stuff. I was like, I want to interview one of these guys, see what they have to say. <laughs> I don't know what we'd get on about. Did, did, did you like, did it make you want to check out their stuff? Let's say on Spotify or YouTube afterwards. Yeah. I mean, it, it definitely made me want to check that out. And it also made me want to check out maybe some of their bigger sets. Um, Cause again, I, I, I think I was sort of sold on that idea that they had all this stuff going on on stage, but I have to think about it too, you know, as a big Kiss fan, for example, they did a run of theater shows in 2004 prepping for their big tour. And that didn't have any of the pyrotechnics. They also do a cruise with no pyro. And that's a great experience for the Kiss fans because they get to see a stripped down version of what they wouldn't usually see. So, you know, putting myself in that perspective, I liked it. And I would honestly give this show a solid rating. I gave it in my in our short review a 6.5 out of 10. And I feel like anybody who's a fan of this group, Joe, they would probably get a lot out of the show. Not a strange question, actually, because we always talk, often talk a lot about ticket prices and stuff like that. Did you get any idea, sense of that? Like, uh, was it full? I'm pretty sure it was about $60 a ticket, and it was yeah. pretty full. I think it, it definitely was questionable to see how full it was because the whole back was full of arcade games and stuff. So I was thinking, even if it was sold out, I don't think people would have filled out the whole venue physically, if that makes sense. 
So mm-hmm. I think the concert area was definitely at capacity or, or at least pretty close, but it seems like more people are coming out for shows now. And I also feel like shows like this, let's face it, it's not going to be $300 for a ticket at a show like this. So I think shows like in this category are actually getting bigger now because it's a little more affordable, a little more accessible. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> yeah, I, can I, can I can go for that, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Who doesn't want that? So shout out to Infected Mushroom and uh, definitely a lot more coverage coming on the way. If you guys want to check out our short version of the event review, we did a 60 second version. Check us out on YouTube on our short section. And of course, on TikTok at Sound Mojo. Hopping over to our Sound Mojo community tab on our YouTube page. Of course, the spot where we put up polls and different questions to see what you guys are listening to. Here we ask, which music festival would you most like to attend? Coachella, Rock in Rio, Tomorrowland, or Bonnaroo? Our audience voted 53% for Rock in Rio, 25% for Coachella, 14 for Tomorrowland, and 8% for Bonnaroo. Rock and Rio taking the lead. I feel like this might be the most fun out of all of them because Brazil knows how to party. Yeah, I agree. And uh, I think it's also just like in terms of uh, notoriety, right? All the maiden, when you see those big, the the, the the amount of people in the back and stuff. So, And Tomorrowland is obviously just as huge. And there's like so many festivals, you know, so like we could only like put four or five on these poles. Uh, but definitely like, uh, you know, I, I, I myself chose rock and Rio, and, uh, you know, I would love to attend a rock and Rio one day. Bonnaroo and Coachella falling behind by big margins. Are these festivals that may be things of the past? No, I don't know. I just think maybe in this, um, you know, in, in this selection, this was the, you know, rock and Rio take, took the cake, but I don't know if we put like example, uh, maybe if we put uh Valken, right, which is the metal festival or, uh, what's another big one? Um, uh rock and ring yeah is rock and ring us we have some comments here we can go down here deitch brand rock and ring and pink pop which i've never heard of any of these obviously <laughs> these are most likely local to uh germany and stuff uh game simmons coachella and power trip so by uh hey, Robert that's a new Stanley. name to me i've never heard of that one yeah i'm assuming just by hearing that i'm thinking it's like power metal or something you know like that's the first thing that came to my mind you know that those type of halloween uh, iron maiden those type of bands i don't know maybe i'm totally wrong let us know in the comments how wrong i am <laughs> give us a scale of the next we'll have a, a poll how wrong is joe no, yeah sorry. exactly <laughs> i need and one of my own too <laughs> let us know which one you picked or would pick and which one you know or that we didn't list in the comments like that you would go to you know Now it's time to hop into our guest portion of today's show. Of course, we're joined, as we mentioned off the top, by Kurt Dimer. He's talking about his brand new single, which drops on April 14th, entitled Doom. He's also excited for his tour dates with Skid Row and Buck Cherry. So if you guys want to catch this live, hit the links down below to connect with Kurt. I feel like the listeners are going to take a lot out of this episode, Joe. Yeah, I mean, what a character. Like, uh, you know, I I just can picture, you know, uh, coffee or a beer and hours of stories from Kurt, yeah. you know, and like interesting stuff too, you know, and just like, just a, you know, I consider myself a very, like, you know, I, I'll dabble in photography, I'll dabble in guitar, music, uh, whatever it may be, you know, very curious person, but I mean, this guy's done actual businesses, you know, like you mentioned the oil business and, you know, going into this uh, music and stuff and then acting and horror movies and then producing his own movie. I thought I had a lot on my plate. Yeah. When does he sleep? Should have been our main question. I think re- revising this interview with that. That's what we should have asked him. Yeah, exactly. But you know what it is? It's, you know, we're, we're not here for a long time, right? We're here for a, a good time and like to try to make the best of it. And I know I couldn't think of a better example of someone like uh Kurt in the sense of like, just do it, man. You know, like uh, just get it done. Like don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Right. Cause people told them all the time. You can, you, you are not going to do that. You're not going to be able to do this. And he did it, you know, and here's the, even with this company, right. Which he's going to talk about with, with his oil and all these different things. So again, yeah. you know, the reason I think it's so valuable for our listeners is because a lot of you guys are aspiring to be in the business or you are in the business and, you know, take it from a guy who's done multifaceted things. This guy has good advice. So listen closely, get your notepads out and enjoy the show. <laughs> I'm on a balcony in Altadena, California, a day off before I start 
shooting my scenes in my movie this week. So awesome, awesome, man! That's huge. So tell us about the project that you're working on this week. Uh, what, what, any details you can give us? I'm out here in California, been rehearsing hard, and uh, we're getting ready to shoot a, a film called Scared to Death that uh, stars Lynn Shay, Bill Mosley, Mike Devil's Rejects, Rob Zombie movies. Lynn Shay's an insidious kingpin uh, over 200 credits, and I'm starring along alongside them, and I'm playing a character called the Grog. So <laughs> nice. Without giving it away, that that that's what we're doing. It's going to come out this fall, and uh, we're just uh, really excited to be out here and shooting this movie this month. So. So in terms of these projects, are you very much hands-on with the creation or, or do you focus more on the on-camera side of things? Well, on, th on this movie, uh, it's, I'm doing it, uh, my production company, Bald Man Films, along with uh, Mirror Films, which is my friend Paul Boyd, who's the director of the movie. And he's the same guy who directed my videos on YouTube, Burn Together and Naive. So we started uh, talking about uh, a sequel or the next in the franchise for my other movie coming out, Hellbilly Hollow, that I star in, which is being shopped right now. And we wrote that script together. And then we just started talking about this script he had had for 10 years called Scared to Death. And I'm like, man, if we get the right people in this, this is a killer, killer horror movie. And horror's big right now. And I think we got a real diamond in the rough here that's going to come out in theaters later this year and really blow people away. So I'm really stoked about it, but that's how this came about. And I'm an executive producer on it, but I'm also one of the stars in it and uh, just continuing to build my acting uh, reel. And uh, hopefully you'll see me in a lot of movies going forward, too. Man, I love it. So, I mean, you know, you talked about the Devil's Rejects, of course, Rob Zombie, a lot of awesome rock and metal people involved in the horror world. Uh, you know, what what do you think the connection is with metal and horror and, and why it seems to go so well hand in hand? Well, I mean, number one, I mean, you can't really have a horror film with um, pop music in it. Or, <laughs> right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah nothing against pop music or any kind of music i mean i love everybody who goes out there and wants to create things and, and do things like that but uh yeah i just think rock and roll and horror go together metal and horror go together it's just uh it's just got that same kind of vibe to it and a lot of people that like rock and roll or any form of rock and roll they tend to also like horror movies and i learned that from being in i was in halloween in 2018 and that's what made me decide to really start creating in the in the horror genre then kind of blend my horror following along with my rock following which is what we've been working on the last couple of years and i think you'll start to see it come alive on stage as well as i get uh you know our, our fans continue to grow and and i'm able to move around and do more with the stage than being direct support so so yeah it's yeah. a great fit and uh, I just think it's because of the vibe that both have. Yeah, no, it, it goes together seamlessly. And speaking of the stage, you guys are going to be, you're going to be hitting the road with Skid Row and Buck Cherry. Um, how are you feeling about yeah. this tour? I mean, this is a powerhouse of a lineup. Yeah, I'm, I'm really stoked about it because, you know, I've, I've been touring what now uh, since September of 21. That was our first tour with Jeff Tate. Then I went out with Ingve Malmsteen, direct support on both those. And to, for those to be my first two tours, I'm pretty damn lucky. And I, and I know that. And then what? Then we did some Tesla dates, which were phenomenal. And then we went out with um, Drowning Pool and did some smaller clubs. And now, now to have the I have Tesla dates coming up in April, which we're going to do after I'm done shooting the movie. And to be able to take the summer and really prep for this Buck Cherry Skid Row tour is phenomenal. It's an amazing next step. And it's the three bands. And we're just going to go around and rock every town out. And I think people are going to have a great night of music, you know, because they all know Buck Cherry and they all know Skid Row. And I'm just going to come out right before them as a surprise. But I, I do have a lot of fans that are excited that I'm coming back. So I think it's a powerhouse night of rock and roll. Do you have any specific approach to how you perform live or how what you're going to do live? 
when I perform live, I just want people that are there to be happy, have a great time. I come out there. I am a very chill, mellow, quiet dude. But when I'm in movies or I'm on stage, I uh, morph into the guy going to talk to a therapist to get shit off my brain, but I just do it in front of people on stage. I'm like a motivational speaker. I like to spread positivity. I like to just be me and uh, just go crazy and people and blow people's minds so they can say, man, glad I came and I saw you guys before Buck Cherry and Skid Row. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's my approach. Just let it go, man. I mean, people come out to be entertained. So I turn That's... on the switch and go. Is it a fun challenge as well when you're, you know, you're before Skid Row and Buck Cherry and you're kind like you're saying, it's almost a surprise for some of the audience. Is that a fun challenge to sort of be introducing some of the audience to you? Because I'm, I'm sure many of them do know you already. Yeah, I mean, every time we've toured now, more and more people are coming back out to our shows. We're definitely building a following. Um, of course, it can't happen quick enough when you're the artist because you want to be the headliner and you want to be able to blow people's minds with it. I want to be very theatrical when I headline. So, but you got to do what you get. You got to walk, walk before you run. And uh, that's what I'm doing. And yeah, I, I, I mean, when I went out with, imagine our second tour and you're going out with one of the, the best known shredders of all time, Ingve. Yeah. And you got a bunch of guitar freaks there, you know, that just love guitar. <laughs> They're and like this my, watching you, right? <laughs> my ass comes out there, you know. And uh and we're just playing rock and roll the way we do it. And people are but then people were coming up to me after because I always meet with everybody after the show because I'm big with the fan. I, I appreciate people and I'm not gonna hide from them. I go out and thank them. We do so all that and they're like, man, we came to see Ingbe, but thank God you were here because we got to just see a real well-balanced rock show. Got to hear him, got to hear you guys. You weren't all the same. It wasn't just constant shredding all night, you know. So people really people loved it, but you can't get anywhere in life if you don't take a chance like that. So Yeah, are there any funny Ingve uh, stories on tour? Because I've seen a lot of them having watched Ingve over the years, uh pranks or stuff like that. Any interesting stories? From tour, yeah, because I know Ingve is like notorious for pranking some oh, of the on tour with Ingve. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I didn't really talk to Ingve till the very last day, and then I went in and <laughs> thanked him for the opportunity. He stays to himself. He uh, mm -hmm. likes to go to movies. He likes to uh, get places quick and not really stop. He's got a bus driver who's amazing and who now drives me around a lot, and uh, he's just the best bus driver and. <laughs> Ing Ingbe just he doesn't want you in his space you know but when the tour was over we got pictures together and I thanked him and I just said man appreciate what you've done for me and he said I know all your songs now yeah because he would he would listen to us which I appreciate and he goes if you ever need somebody to fill in I can play every one of your tunes <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> yeah. there you go it was cool you know and I respect people's space I mean Ingbe doesn't want to talk what yeah yeah just thankful you gave me the stage you know beautiful that's great so. would you say it's typically that way or is it typically a more communal thing backstage because i know it depends very much on the artist on the artist yeah like we yeah. went out um, jeff tate it was more communal uh because jeff was in a music video of mine and we actually became friends before the tour so that was that was nice and then um drowning pool i know all those guys we were on ship rock together my manager at the time also managed them uh, and Tesla, they're just great dudes. I mean, they take care of you when you're the opener. They include you in the catering and all that stuff. And and uh, my my current manager now actually is Brian Wheat, who's the bass player of Tesla. Oh, yeah. oh wow! So yeah, yeah. we became. He noticed, checked out part of our set when we were playing in Midland, opening up for him, direct support. And he said, "I love your vibe. I love you're like my other band that I do uh, called Soul, Soul Motor and." We just talked and didn't even think about him being a, my manager. But later on, I just decided, man, I like Brian's vibe and uh, he's no nonsense. And in the music business, it's so hard and people are always gunning for you, especially somebody like me who started other businesses in my life and then decided to get back into this later on. So I'm like a target and uh, Brian protects me really well. So. Money hungry.
Had you done music before going into acting as well? Well, I did. I did music until I was 20 years old, okay. and uh, I was going nowhere fast and partying a little too much, and needed to get my shit together. And so I quit, and I ended up getting married at a young age. I have three beautiful sons. I started my own oil companies later on in the 99 that all run themselves now but up until then i worked for other companies and learned how to to do things and knew i didn't want to work for a corporation and be kick, you know kissing people's ass all the time like my dad did his whole life god bless him and uh i just told my dad i go i learned the oil business he got me into chevron and i said i'm gonna take what i've learned and i'm gonna roll the dice and start my own and uh wow. the rest is history so now my starfire oil brands everywhere but i i got out of the music at 20 i was playing in a band locally in cincinnati where i'm from going to college there after i had kind of partied my way out of a couple colleges before that <laughs> and uh i was on the six-year college plan <laughs> and uh so i did started these other companies and then in 2017 September, I went down to do a cameo because our brand, oil brand, was in this movie Trading Paint starring John Travolta. Mm -hmm. And I went down to do a cameo in the movie and be like a check presenter or whatever. They cast me in a role. They said, We need a track announcer. We like your look. Do you want to be in the movie? And I got into that. Then two months later, I got into Halloween, was killed by Michael Myers and the one with Jamie Lee Curtis, the nice. official reboot or what do you call it a sequel to the original yeah and i just said from there and about a year later i was down shooting more movies in alabama smaller films and i met a gentleman by the name of ben trexel through somebody i was working with at the time who directed some of my music videos and shit for my uh, podcast i was doing and uh he had some songs and we laid them down and then i just kept writing and uh just kept coming up with hooky tunes and i got back into music so that's kind of how it all unfolded so it was a sign when i got into trading paint and i said now i can go back and be the creative that i always been and not suppress it so which one do you find more challenging to do would you find owning your companies more challenging or, or the creative ventures they're both unique in their own way and challenging because, the, and they're both things where everybody around you is going to tell you, you can't do it. You know, if right. I listen to everybody who said, you're going to start your own oil company at this point, the one all these other oil, I, and people kept telling me I couldn't do it. And I said, well, I'm going to prove to everybody that I can and the rest is history there. And it was very hard. I mean, I worked 12, 15 hour days. I had no vacation for 20 years. I'd go on a cruise with my kids and my ex-wife and I'd have to work the whole time. I remember being at Disney World with my kids and my two, my two, my two oldest who were young at the time. And I was in a phone booth, you know, with a calling card selling wow. oil while they're riding rides. I mean, you, there's no, you can't, it's 24 seven. And insane. on the creative side, it's the same amount of work and everything, but in music, there's very little return unless you build up a name and you can tour and make money touring and selling your merch because you certainly don't make much on streaming and all that. So that's a challenge and everybody thinks I'll fail. So I'm going to continue to go until I succeed at that. And that's making right. me it's just, I didn't know I had it in me. When I was young, I was always very nervous and anxious. Now I take control of the stage. I'm not nervous in front of it. I love being in front of a camera. And uh, I just, it comes natural to me. I just go right to turn it on and I'll morph into any character. So it's really the movies is easy. There's a lot that goes on before and after you shoot it, which is challenging. But I would have to say the hardest of all three is the music business. The way you make money. It's very difficult to obtain yeah, because yeah. Of the way the way it's set up, you know. Oh yeah, it's so overly complicated, complex for no reason. Yeah, exactly. Would you say that you know younger artists, uh, you know, let's say somebody came to you today and they're starting a band, and they ask if they should sign to a record label, what would you say to that artist? Would Would you say that that's sort of a model that's still valid, or is that going out of style? Um. 
I'm not signed to a record label. I own my own label. And the way the system's set up now, if you have the right management, you don't necessarily have to own your own label anymore. You don't have to rely on that label. I, I have the means to run my own label. Hell, I'll sign other artists to my label if I think they're good enough. That's right. Um, but if a label came to me as I got bigger, I'd be stupid not to talk to them. But what mm -hmm. can you bring me that I can't already bring to myself? So I would tell the artist to start, stay true to your music, be who you are once and then take it in stride. And if a label comes to you, weigh your options because you really do have the option of owning your own label, owning your own publishing. Um, a lot of power has been taken away from the labels with the streaming. So, Yeah, without a doubt. And speaking of your music, of course, the new single, Doom, is going to be coming up. Yes. Uh, yeah. What can people expect with this? Because I know there's obviously anticipation. Well, Doom is uh, a song I wrote for my horror franchise, Hellbilly Hollow. Um, when Hellbilly Hollow comes out, hopefully around fall this year, um, it's a featured song in the movie. I, yeah. You know, I wrote it for the movie, but it's so catchy. And then I went back and revisited it. And my man, current manager, Brian, uh, we heard it when he watched the movie. He goes, what's that song? Is that one of your songs? And I go, yeah, that's my song, Doom. And he goes, dude, that's catchy as hell. And I'm like, all right, well, let's take it to the radio guys and a couple others that we have. And they, We've got three we're going to put out as singles over the summer. And Doom was the one they wanted to go with first because they feel it can really do well on rock radio all over the place and uh, even on, you know, an octane or anything like that. Yeah. So it's just got that vibe. It takes you takes you to a dark place, but it punches you right in the face with the chorus. So but that's how that all came about. It's going to be featured in the movie as well. So can we expect visuals for this uh, song in terms of a music video or, or will it just be in, in the film? Yeah, before I got to uh, L.A., I flew up to uh, upstate New York and was in a 1800s type home that's huge with like 30 rooms in it wow. and all kinds of oddities and crazy stuff. So I went up there and shot a music video for Doom before I headed out here to shoot the movie, literally two days before. So hmm. there will that's be so a visual. Cool. There will be a cool video with it. Yeah. Awesome. Sounds like a fun house or something like that. Sounds interesting. Oh, it was, dude, it was crazy. It, it was crazy, man. I mean, there was <laughs> shit you'd never thought you'd see in your life in that house. So <laughs> plenty of scenery. The chorus on Doom, it alludes to uh heroin addiction and shit, but I didn't want to show the real true horror of somebody shooting up here, but I wanted people to realize this is some evil shit. And subtly, I always am trying to subtly help people and mm. in my lyrics and bring a positive message so i think you guys will get that out of it when it comes out interesting yeah it almost seems like if you were to subtly add you know good messages to your music it's easier than sort of hitting people over the head with like stop using you know stuff like that right i always write my lyrics to make people think about okay how can i apply this to my life even like my song on my um, ep that's out my work hard rock hard what you're saying i wrote that during the pandemic and it's just like people think if we're just kind to each other and take care of each other the world could be a better place but we're all divided now really it's simple shit and i try to write and make people think and i have people come up to me in tears like you touched me with that song or I, there's a track that's really popular we close all of our our sets with called naive i wrote it about getting screwed over by people in the music business as i kept fighting my way through it but i'm helping other people don't be naive in your daily life either you know yeah look for the signs look for the narcissistic behaviors around you and don't be naive to it or you'll get taken advantage of like i have so you got to listen to that intuition man like many times yeah. i've not listened to it and like damn i should have listened to it you know exactly and when you go often when you go against your intuition and i'm very intuitive you're gonna it's not gonna come out right and uh, you learn that and I've been through a lot of shit in my life and I'm just sharing it with other people and hopefully so they don't have to go through all the pain because I'm able to get right back up and keep going. Others aren't. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. You know, one thing we know about you uh, is that you're a big fan of Pink Floyd and yeah. ha we have an episode coming up to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Dark Side. Um, just curious, you know, 
what are your thoughts on on that record and maybe sort of the impact that Dark Side of the Moon has had 50 years after its release? Well, the I know one impact it had a lot of people, including myself, tripped on acid to that, <laughs> that yeah. album over the years. That was the roadmap. <laughs> yeah, it, it helped increase in acid sales. But no, that album <laughs> was, it's amazing. It, it's, they came out, they did it their way, which is when people interview me, it's like, I'm doing it my way. Do I talk sometimes? Do I do this sometimes? Yes, but Pink Floyd did it their way too. Van Halen did it their way. What is the right way? And so many people want to tell you what it's got to be like. It's like cookie mm -hmm. cutter. And you know? it's like, I'm either going to make it the way I want to do it, or I'm not going to make it. And I'll give it all I got. And Pink Floyd did that. And look at where they are now. They're legends. And who couldn't put on that album? Anybody. And even if you're not a rock fan and just listen to it and trip out a little bit and be like, man, this is some good fucking music by some great musicians. And it's a phenomenal album. And uh, I'm sure, you know, I did a cover of have a cigar. Yeah. And that's how much Pink Floyd means to me. And that's the first song I put out to the public and we play it every show. People nice. love it. So, so yeah, Pink Floyd, great band i wish david and uh, roger would get along but uh you know we can't control all that so how does it rank in terms of others other albums pink floyd albums that's the best pink floyd album oh yeah mm. well yeah to me it's number one so i could see it if i if i had to pick one to take on to a, a island oh, i was stranded on i would take that pink floyd album i would take uh probably queen's greatest hits and led zeppelin something with what uh physical graffiti and i'd be happy yeah nice. so. super solid super solid picks yeah uh of course here at watch mojo we're well known for our top 10 lists and uh this interview is going to be no exception so to wrap it up we pulled the top 10 greatest horror movies of all time and we're just wondering kurt if you could maybe guess what our top three entries could be the top three entries yeah, yeah. the top of three greatest time. yeah and, and i mean this could be this could be your top three or this could be you guessing what we put it's up to you all right well so you want me to see if any of what i say is on the list yeah, yeah. and we're, we're gonna we're gonna <laughs> reveal right. the top three night a nightmare nightmare on elm street okay um I'll give you a few. The Shining. Oh, um, that's my favorite. Um, Amityville Horror, the original one, and uh, Poltergeist, and mm. my favorite of all times, The Devil's Rejects, and House of a Thousand Corpses. <laughs> okay. So, well, it looks like almost every single one was on the list. <laughs> but the top three is looking a little different. So number three was Dracula from 1931. Yeah, yeah, I've never seen that. Okay, but number I can two. See why it's like the original classic. Yeah, so. that's it. It's like the Beatles are on top of everybody's right. list, right? <laughs> right. That's the thing. Number two, The Exorcist. Yeah, that was good. And that, then that number one. Me out a little bit. That, that, oh. that, I could see why it would be that, yeah, that head spinning when you're little. <laughs> that, I was little. That was me too, me. man. That that still scared the crap out. I remember running to my room. Anything <laughs> about the omen or the exorcist shit, it's a little too real. Like, is this really yeah, going off around us? But go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt. No, oh. no. It's uh, We'd love to hear the commentary. And number one, Psycho, 1960. Psycho. Yeah. yeah. So they want... They want uh, somewhat old on their exorcist what's from the 70s yeah. they really meant from all time i guess yeah <laughs> they went yeah. 30s 60s and 70s <laughs> yeah i mean there's still like you know in the list there's obviously silence of the lambs uh, oh love ha that one yeah halloween is number eight here the, the original number 1978 uh scream which is more of like it's funny that you said pop because i i see scream as like almost like a pop horror movie you know like uh yeah yeah, uh, and they're doing, kind of, I think, isn't like Scream 11 coming out now? Yeah, yeah the six, six, done 10 or 11. Six. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Night of the Living Dead, that I remember watching with my, I remember watching that with my friends in elementary school and just being like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Texas Chainsaw, all those movies were classic, you know? Yeah, that's yeah, a really yeah. good one too. 
We love it, man. Well, solid picks. Well, listen, Kurt, thank you so much for your time. We encourage everybody to go check out the brand new single. It's going to be dropping April 14th. Anything that you want to drop in uh, to let our listeners know? Other than no, that? I do, I just uh, I'd love to come out to any of your cities. I'd love to headline. I'd love to put on a horror rock show for you, but we got to get there first. So hit me up on any Facebook. Uh, really, we focus on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter at Kurt Dimer, uh, D-E-I-M-E-R. My website's being revamped right now, KurtDimer.com. YouTube, subscribe to that channel because there'll be way more stuff coming out on there. And uh, just love to meet all of you. And uh, thank you for being a fan somewhere on the road. We can't wait to see all of you. Awesome, and I appreciate sir. you guys for having me because without people like you, people wouldn't know who I am. And I appreciate you guys very much. Wow, thank you. The feeling is mutual, my friend. Thank you so much, dude. And, and keep on rocking. Hey, thank you guys. Appreciate you awesome. guys so much. Take Peace care. Thank you, man. Thank you. Have a have a good tour. Oh, thank you guys. Appreciate it. Anyone's a hero. Come in to save the day. Show us a better way. Everyone's a hero. Someone Huge shout out to Kurt Dimer for joining us on episode 113 of the Inner Sleeve Music Podcast. I got to say, you know, I feel like I learned a lot just watching this interview back. Uh, <laughs> again, what does this, what doesn't this guy do? I don't know, man, but you could see I tried to get a nice, uh, juicy Momstein story or something from behind yeah. when I asked them because I've heard so many stories of people that I've opened up for, toured with, or even just in general from other musicians that we see talking about, like uh, Ingve. Uh, it's, it's just funny. I know I just wanted to know, you know, and like when you mentioned, you know, I'm here, I am playing on my second tour or first, whatever he's opening for Momstein and like all the guys in the audience are all like, you know, shredders, you know, yeah. like impress me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's like, uh, it could be intimidating, but see, like that was the whole point of the interview, right? It's like, just get her done. Do it, man. Like don't let people stop you. You know, you're not hurting anybody. You're not doing anything. You're just trying to do music. You're trying to get yourself, you know, out there and, and, and you know live your dream you know so that's yeah. uh very inspirational you know look there's no age you know i i remember growing up like you know learning guitar and then i had my friends who were of, of the same age telling me oh it's too late for me like, what are you talking about like guitar <laughs> is for life and instruments for life it's not just because oh you want to make it in a band no like you're gonna be playing guitar or ho hopefully playing an instrument you know your whole life that's what music is like that gift that just keeps on giving and you know that's the thing especially if you really love it you're not just picking it up to try to make some quick cash or try to get some popularity you know if you, if you really love, love what you're that. playing and that's the thing right <laughs> so it's like there's definitely easier ways to get that as well so mm -hmm. uh yeah definitely the passion has to be there and and i i would say kurt's interview is definitely a testament to that we appreciate you guys for checking into this brand new episode of the podcast. If you like what you saw, whether you're watching on YouTube or you're watching on Mojo TV, head over to YouTube and hit that subscribe button and subscribe to Sound Mojo on our official YouTube channel. We love communicating with the Sound Mojo family on there. We communicate, we respond to all of your comments. So come check in and let us know what you're watching, what you're listening to, and lots of comms tabs posts as well, Joe, with different verses, things like that. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting, you know, like I'm always trying to think, okay, how, what can I ask to get, you know, a better uh, view of who's watching and who's listening and like, or what we can, you know, improve upon, right? And just fun. And you know, it's funny. It's like we've, when we did for the longest time, we did those, uh, you know, su music suggestions and stuff, which, you know, may, might come back and stuff, but like, yep. we, we'll, we'll see. But it's like, wow, it was just like the diversity was incredible. And I saw the same thing with like, you know, as I do the comms tabs, you know, like, um, the community tab, sorry. Uh, it's, it's interesting to see like different festivals. Like we just saw all over the world, uh, uh, different songs, you know, some of them will, yeah. it'll be like, uh, you know, tell us a song that tells a story or what's a song that has this, or, uh, you know, what was your first, whatever, you know? So it's like, I know sometimes they feel to me, they feel a bit generic, but it's really cool to, to get the feedback from people and like, and, and their honest opinions, you know, of like what they think, you know, you might not like we had recently, we had, um, was it Eric Clapton versus Jimi Hendrix. And it yes. was, it was interesting to see that like a lot of people, cause I figured I always grew up as Clapton is the God Clapton right. is like whatever, you know, and obviously Jimmy is too, but it's funny to hear now 50 years later after he's gone, after like, he's only put out three albums and like the pull was super heavy for, yeah. for Jimi Hendrix, you know? So it's still it's, so iconic all these years later. It's, it's insane to impact. see. 
Yeah. That's why we love to do it. And we love to hear what you guys are thinking. Look, we have people from all across the globe tuned in. So it's definitely going to be a lot of cool, eclectic opinions. And uh, we're definitely excited to hearing more of them. Also, make sure to come chat with us on social media. Sound Mojo on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, and Facebook. We're easy to find at Sound Mojo. New content constantly. So make sure to come and interact with it. Give us a like, give us a comment. Again, we love to interact with you guys on all of those platforms. Also, make sure to come check in on our audio platforms. That's Apple Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, wherever you can find an audio feed for a podcast, we are available on that platform. So come and check us out. And if you don't mind, leave us a five-star review as well. We'd love to get those numbers going up on Spotify and Apple, and it definitely helps out the show. We're everywhere, man. <laughs> That's what yeah, I'm we are everywhere. everywhere. You can't escape <laughs> us. You, know? you can't escape us even if you try. Thank you so much for tuning into this brand new episode, episode 113. We'll catch you guys next time.